<clears throat> if everyone can get seated so we can start up again with a very distinguished panel. Um, before I get started, I wanted to say a couple things. First of all, your lunch that you're enjoying comes care of a law firm here in Atlanta, Smith, G Gambrell, and Russell. And we want to say thank you to that firm for bringing lunches for everybody. But I also want to take a moment to say with this spectacular conference, there are a couple people who have really been instrumental to make it happen. One is Emory Law School graduate uh, Ruben Gutman, who was moderated the last panel, and I was joking that this conference could be called Four Friends of Ruben, since uh, <laughs> most of us are friends of Ruben. Um, and also uh, LaShawn Warren, who's, you've seen her working, walking around a lot. She's with the uh, American Constitution Society and has been instrumental in, as well. Uh, it is my great honor to introduce uh, John T. Nixon, United States District Court Judge, uh, the Middle District of Tennessee, and UW Clemen, who until recently was a U.S. District Court Judge in the Northern District in Alabama and uh, Birmingham. Um, I should, for full disclosure, point out that I'm a former law clerk of Judge Nixon, and I'm currently co-counsel with Judge Clemen since he got off the bench. He and I have been uh, working together. Uh, so let me just say that uh, we could not have two more uh, courageous federal judges than John Nixon and UW Clemen. Uh, recently, a young lawyer, um, I suggested that she apply to uh, clerkship with Judge Nixon, and I said you could not find a more judicious person, a smarter person than J Judge Nixon. You can learn so much from him. And I said, but you know, I'm biased because I clerk for him, so let's go look in the federal almanac and see what it says about him. I've never seen a more glowing set of lawyer comments than about Judge Nixon. Uh, they talk about his brilliance, about his fairness, his judiciousness, and I know from the year I spent with him how well respected he is in Nashville. But the one word that was missing, Judge, when I read that was the word courage. If you know the history of John Nixon, that's the word that comes to my mind. When he was a young lawyer, he uh, left from, you know, graduated from Vanderbilt Law School and went down to Anniston, Alabama to become the city attorney. And, he, and that was in the early 1960s. And what he did there is he created an interracial commission to help foster better relations in the community at that very polarized time. And then he was the first city attorney to prosecute the Ku Klux Klan in that part of Alabama and risk his life doing that and it was because of that and other reasons that the Justice Department, Burke Marshall and John Doerr recruited him to come to DC to be a civil rights attorney in the emerging <clears throat> civil rights division. And his first assignment as a young lawyer at Department of Justice was, well, there are marches going on in Selma, Alabama about voting rights and we have reasons to believe that Dr. Martin Luther King could be in severe danger and it's your job to keep the peace there and to keep him alive. And that was John, John Nixon's first assignment and he went down the Selma and as you heard John Lewis today and how meaningful it was to have the protection of lawyers there and how he, he's alive because of the protection of lawyers. And J Judge Nixon was down there and while he was there, his wife gave birth to his sec second daughter. He, he was, uh, uh, at the crossroads of where if he wasn't there, he, that we would have seen much more violence in Selma. And he, we owe him as a country so much gratitude for what he did in that moment in time. And we had the privilege, us as former law clerks, to join him this past May in Selma, Alabama, where it was John T. Nixon Day in May, May of this year. Um, and we went to Brown's Chapel and celebrated his service as a lawyer and a jurist. Uh, and on the bench, that courage continued, and he, despite whatever the public opinion might have been in Nashville and Middle District of Tennessee, if he saw something unconstitutional, he was gonna hold it unconstitutional. He held death row unconstitutional in the state of Tennessee. While, we, while I was cooking for him, there was a uh, case regarding parental consent on abortion that he found unconstitutionally vague. Whatever the popular opinion is, he wouldn't follow that. He would follow the rule of law. And that's why he is so well respected and revered in Tennessee and it is really tremendous 
for us to have him here today. Next to him, uh, by the way, Judge John Nixon was appointed by President Carter in 1980. Well, UW Clemen was appointed by President Carter in 1980 as well. And that is another courageous civil rights attorney and jurist. Judge Clemen, um, when he was, a, uh, before he went to law school, and he was a young man, he applied to <coughs> law school at uh, University of Alabama Law School. But in those days of segregation, they would not let UW Clemen in the door. So he, in turn, then went to Columbia Law School. And he came back to Alabama and made sure they would never forget what happened and that he was instrumental in getting desegregation in the school systems, desegregation that Bob Strope was talking about, what, what Judge Clement did as a young lawyer in terms of the workplace, the industrial workplace. All across the state of Alabama, he brought justice and he desegregated all walks of life. And that is why he's such a legend in Alabama. And what happened is that he was the first African-American U.S. District Court judge in the state. He was revered. If you talk to lawyers in that state, he is revered. And he has showed courage also as a district court judge in the cases before him. And the, one of the cases that he had, one of his last years on the bench, was the Lily Ledbetter case that went to trial. And she got a fair shake. And she got a verdict that was taken by the way by the Court of Appeals um, based on a technical statute of limitations um, point of view that actually was trying to change the law. Judge Clement applied the law that was the universal law around the country. But the 11th Circuit, in an activist way, tried to change the law, was affirmed by the, by the Court of Appeals, and then ultimately Congress had to step in to reverse that decision and reinstate the law to just the way that Judge Clement had saw it. So we are really, really privileged to have them here today. And what I wanted to start the con I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to turn it over to you all. I wanted to start with President Obama has said that the life and work experiences really matter when it comes to appointing jurists. And I want to ask each of you what about that, talk a little bit about your biographies. I touched on them a little bit, but what you thought your what your life and work experiences that, prior to being on the bench brought you know helped you as a jurist. Sure. <clears throat> well, I will start off by saying that uh, several years ago, I was honored uh, by my old high school as the alumnus of the year, and my older daughter had attended that same high school, and she was asked for some comments for the program, and she said, you cannot understand my father unless you understand the, his relationship with his father. <clears throat> and I had the great good fortune to have a father who was a hero to his son. And my father grew up, on, he was a college professor, a historian, later political scientist who grew up on a northeast Alabama cotton farm where there were two dozen tenant families, <clears throat> two-thirds of them white. And in the 1930s, he was very concerned with the social and economic problems of the South. And he would testify before a congressional committee, not as a professor, but as the administrator of an estate that had this 2,000 acres and these tenant farmers. And at that time, the federal government was paying landlords not to plant cotton. And he appeared before the committee and said, if you are going to pay the landlord not to plant cotton, the sharecropper should get a share of that payment just as he would get a share of the crop. Otherwise, you just have a landlord's code. And he went into, of course, this was when I was a child. I was not aware of it. I found out about it later. He went into 
investigate a dispute in Gadsden, Alabama, a labor dispute, was concerned that this northern company was trying to be unionized by southern workers who were being attacked by the, southern, by the local police, southern police officers. He was disturbed by it. He was chairman of a citizens committee. And that night, when he went back to the hotel, he was told, you cannot stay here. If you're lynched, we don't want you dragged out of this hotel. So I had a legacy of courage and concern for the social problems of the South. And when I got out of law school, I went back down to where he was from to begin my legal practice, my law practice, as sort of a, a sense of romantic sense of returning to my roots. And this, um, and then became city attorney and uh, con convinced the city commission to establish a biracial council. And so these, uh, so my father was willing to be different. He had the courage to be different. And so that was the legacy that I had. He was the older father. And I wanted, to, I have said that I chose not to follow in my father's footsteps. He was an academician. I chose to follow alongside my father's footsteps. And that has made a difference when I am on the bench. I am willing to be different, to be different from the prevailing views of the community. My handling of death penalty habeas corpus cases resulted in pickets outside the courthouse, hate mail, and resulted in the Tennessee State Senate passing a resolution calling upon Congress to impeach me. <clears throat> and interesting that the votes it passed and the votes against that resolution came from all of the black members of the Tennessee State Senate and um, Steve Cohen, who is now the congressman from Memphis representing an African-American district. And I think that this, that a judge's background, an ap, a, someone being considered for a judge, the background of that person is significant to see how that person will handle the responsibilities and duties of being a federal judge. And so that's, and, and I'll, um, uh, Cyrus mentioned that am I going to Selma I was not sure what I was supposed to do when I, that night that I went, first night I went down there and Dr. King was about to start the Selma movement. <clears throat> but I, um, I saw the Ku Klux Klan leader from, Al from Aniston, whom I had prosecuted once, and so I was able to tell the FBI that uh, the Klan leader from from uh, Aniston, Alabama, had come down. And I might mention, Cyrus mentioned my um, having a daughter born when I was in Selma. And uh, I was very excited about that. She was born the, the day that uh, Lyndon Johnson addressed uh, the nation in a joint session of Congress. Uh, saying that the 65 Voting Rights Act was being, was being introduced. And um, I wanted to name her Selma Ann, but her, she's very grateful to her mother that, <laughs> <laughs> that she was not named, named that. But I will say that that has made an impact what I did has made an impact on her 
and she teaches in the Los Angeles school system, and she teaches at the Johnny Cochran Middle School. So she is carrying on the, uh, where her students are African American and Hispanic. So I would say that uh, I said this family tradition has, a, has a, had its effect upon me, a very positive effect upon me, of, of willing to be different and willing to be, make tough decisions. And I'd also say that I have, um, uh, Cyrus Mary was a clerk of mine and a very fine clerk, and I've had my own a pursuit of diversity in law clerks. I was the first judge in Middle Tennessee to have an African-American law clerk. I had a law clerk who was born in Haiti, one born in Japan, one born in Bangladesh. Um, uh, Cyrus' parents came from Iran. I also had one who was born in Kenya. Uh, I've had uh, a law clerk whose parents came from Egypt. Uh, from India, so, and, and I have found that diversity to be very, very stimulating for me. So that's, I would say this, that uh, I would agree with President Obama, the life experiences in the background of the person are very important in terms of how they will handle some very important duties. I would uh, echo uh, Judge Nixon's uh, remarks. I'm one of uh, nine children of Mississippi sharecroppers who migrated to the steel mills of, of Birmingham, Alabama in 1941. I was born two years later. Um, thoroughly segregated uh, city, Birmingham was uh, on its way to becoming the, the most thoroughly segregated city um, in the nation. At age 13, I witnessed an incident of police brutality, and uh, out of that experience came uh, my decision to become a civil rights lawyer. And I um, started at Morehouse, but quickly, <laughs> came back home to Birmingham and was involved in the civil rights struggle there in 1962. Uh, the students of Miles College embarked on a selective buying campaign because boycotts were illegal under Alabama law, so we called it selective buying campaign in which we urged black citizens of Birmingham not to patronize the downtown stores which offended their dignity. And the, uh, the selective buying campaign was so successful that the Wall Street Journal reported that in the week leading up to Easter in 1962, business was down by 40% in the downtown stores. National attention, uh, that summer I had to make up because I missed the first quarter at Miles, and so a group of students had collected some uh, signatures on a petition asking the city commission to rescind its segregation ordinances. And so I decided to go along with the group down to the Birmingham City Hall, and when we got there, the incoming president of the student body got a bit weak need, and so the group elected me to present the petition to Bull Connor. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got up and made a few remarks, and he wanted to know where, where I came from. I said, well, I'm, I'm from uh, Westfield. Westfield is a, a company town owned by U.S. Steel. Willie Mays is from Westfield. And he then declared that I didn't live in Birmingham, and, I, and that I was an outside agitator, and I'd better sit down and get out of town before sundown, <laughs> which I did. <laughs> um, that fall, SCLC had its convention in 
Birmingham, and Dr. King decided uh, that there would be demonstrations in the ensuing spring, and I participated in those demonstrations, even though I was uh, wanted to be a lawyer and knew full well the risk that I was running. I presented myself as a, a potential for arrest. Uh, uh, desegregated the Birmingham Public Library, was not arrested because in the group was what the white policeman perceived to be a white lady. She was actually black, but you couldn't tell it by looking at her. Uh, the next day, a group of obviously blacks, all blacks went down and they all went to jail. I, I consider that as the Lord's divine intervention to save me from having to explain something to the Commission on, on Character and Fitness when I uh, would enter the practice of law. So I went on to Columbia, um, started working at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, came back to Birmingham, uh, practiced law, uh, among other things, sued Bear Bryant to get blacks on the football team, but that wasn't what convinced them. It was actually the game with USC <laughs> in 1970 with Sam Bam Cunningham and they came to Legion Field in Birmingham and uh, I'm, I'm told that one of the uh, avid Alabama fans said when he saw the startup team for USC, I thought we were playing some team from California. Hell, that's Gramlin. <laughs> and Gramlin went on to beat the daylights out of uh, University of Alabama's football team, and, Pe and Bear Bryant got religion. Uh, from that point on, he recruited black players with a passion so that uh, we dismissed the suit ultimately because that was before uh, civil rights attorneys got fees when they won cases. <laughs> uh, in 1972, I was elected to the Alabama State Senate and uh, served there until I was appointed to the bench. During that time, I had a number of clashes with uh, uh, Governor Wallace uh, over various uh, racial issues. My uh, appointment by President Carter to the bench was the most controversial judicial appointment, certainly in the state of Alabama, probably in the South in terms of uh, federal judgeships. Uh, I was ultimately uh, confirmed unanimously by the United States uh, Senate and uh, embarked on a 28 and a half year career as a liberal judge. And uh, my experiences were brought to bear on the various cases over which I presided. And uh, I came to the point that uh, uh, being a federal judge was no longer an experience which I enjoyed because I was having to comply with decisions from high courts with which I profoundly disagreed. I was rather regularly reversed by the 11th Circuit. They still reversing me after I retire. <laughs> <laughs> but if it had been otherwise, I would have known that I was doing something wrong. And um, I, I simply say to you that uh, ours is a great country. I have undying faith in it but I am deeply troubled by the recent trends, and maybe we'll get a chance to talk about that a little more. Well, thank you both for that, those uh, comments. Um, I wanna ask each of you an individual question based on the prior panels. Um, the first panel we had today was on the new pleading standards from Twomley and Iqbal. And uh, Judge Nixon and I were chatting last night, and you said there's a historical piece of this that is missing in the debate, and I thought maybe you could address that. <clears throat> what I was saying, what I told Cyrus, and 
what I have thought about is that um, most of the white people who came to this country came here looking for a second chance. And that has been a very, very important part of our history, the second chance. And of course, in the beginning of this country, of the courts, we had common law pleading. Common law pleading, you chose your form of action, be it a sumpsit, trespass, forgotten the others. And then there would be a demurra. And if the demurra was sustained, defense would demur, then that was the end of the case. If the demurra was not sustained, well then the plaintiff won. And in America, the concept of amending the complaint was unknown in England, amending the complaint. And so we have had this process of the second chance. And so it bothers me that we are moving toward a pleading system where there is not a second chance, that a country built on the built by people seeking a second chance. And so that's my. Judge Clement, the, <clears throat> oh, by the way, talk in terms of Judge Nixon and history, you can tell from talking to him, he just loves history, he's son of a historian, and that was one of the great pleasures we had as law clerks was to, his knowledge of American history is just uh, uh, extraordinary. I don't know anyone who knows it as well as he does. Um, Judge Clement, in the prior panel, Leslie Prohl at Legal Defense Fund mentioned that you signed on an amicus brief um, regarding that case from Gadsden, Alabama, um, Ash versus Tyson's is, I believe, the name of it. Why did you sign on to it, and what what do you think is the import of that? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> I knew I'd get get a question you'd like. <laughs> there is this case, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Ash versus Tyson Foods, and and Hishon versus Tyson Foods from days from Gasden, Alabama, the Tyson Chicken Food Plant there, and. Um, you heard one aspect of it where the, the, the white supervisor goes up to both Mr. Ash and later Mr. Hishon. Mr. Hishon is at lunch at the plant uh, eating with his wife who also works there. And the supervisor comes up and says to him, boy, get back to work. And the wife says, well, he's not a, he's not a boy. He's not a man. Well. Uh, we, we've had, as you heard, two uh, majority white juries finding that that uh, reference uh, indicated racial animus in the uh, panel of the 11th Circuit uh, after the Supreme Court said that uh, the first uh, reversal of the jury's verdict on the boy issue was not warranted. Case came back down and a second jury made the same finding. Panel of the 11th Circuit said, uh, has again said that that was not racist. Well, in my view, it, that panel's decision not only defies the uh, United States Supreme Court, it also defies the dictionary because you know the dictionary has a definition of boy and one of the meanings is a racial epithet for a black man. But there's, a, there's probably an even more important aspect of that case, which I guess is now a matter of, of law. Because also in that case, in the first, in the Ash v. Tyson case the first time, the, the major issue was one of what standard uh, must be applied in a race or sex discrimination case. And the 11th Circuit has a, had adopted a standard. Uh, it was sort of reminiscent of what uh, we as, as young blacks were taught that it's not, it's not uh, good enough to be equal to uh, your comparators. You've got to be better than they are. Well, the, the 11th Circuit went a step further. It said that 
the standard for the Title VII plaintiff was that uh, his or her qualifications were so far superior to that of the uh, white candidate, a, a male candidate, that they jumped off the page and slapped you in the face. That was the legal formula <laughs> set by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. When it went up to the United States Supreme Court, and you know the Supreme Court uh, is not a flaming liberal court, but that court, even Justice Thomas joining in, said, well, you know, that's, that's probably uh, a little too much. I mean, you, you know, you, you, can't, you can't use that formula. So we'll send it back to you. And it came back to the 11th Circuit. And the 11th Circuit said, well, uh, all right, we won't, we won't, we won't use uh, jump off the page and slap you in the face. <laughs> but the standard is the same. And when Mr. Ash sought certiorari again, the Supreme Court denied it. So that's the standard uh, in this case. I signed in, as one of the civil rights leaders in the uh, petition seeking rehearing en banc uh, in the 11th Circuit because the sanction of the use of the word boy in the context in which it was used in that case is another eerie reminder of the determination by some to send black folks back to the cotton fields. And uh, uh, I understand how alarming that sounds to some, but uh, Judge Nixon and others will remember that in 1871, we had black legislators, uh, even in Congress from Alabama, 10 years later, Virtually all black names had been removed off the voting rolls, and we didn't get blacks in Congress again for nearly 100 years. In fact, it was more than 100 years. And so I'm, I'm keenly aware that history does in, indeed repeat itself and that those who do not learn from its lessons uh, may be doomed to repeat them. And the sanction of the word boy to me uh, was a rallying cry for those of us of goodwill who are determined not to return to the cotton fields to stand up and speak out. What? Uh, Judge Nixon, I, go ahead. Again, I had a little point of history. The first African American to serve in Congress was an ex-slave from Selma, Alabama, which we, um, and then of course, following along with what Judge Clemens said, and then we have to go forward to have a 1965 Voting Rights Act to guarantee that the people of Dallas County, the black people of Dallas County can have the right to vote. Well, when I travel with Judge Clement and people ask him how does he like being off the bench, he likes to say, I got my First Amendment rights back. And so, Judge, it's good to be here. I'm glad you have those back so you can speak out. And I also <laughs> say, I feel like an emancipated slave. <laughs> <laughs> well, getting back to the earlier panels, um, Judge Clement, Judge Nixon, um, you heard the new the hurdles that seem to be increasing for civil rights litigants and their counsel. You know, we have increased pleading standards. We have mandatory arbitration. It's harder to get uh, classes certified. Um, the field is shrinking in terms of how we can enforce the law. So what advice do you have for us who are on the front lines trying to enforce the civil rights laws? How can we do a better job 
to increase the chances of success? Well, I think that you can, you can approach the judge with some of the things that, you, that have been discussed at this conference, such as the early discovery when the motion to dismiss is filed. Ask the judge for, for that early discovery so that you can meet the plausible rule. That's an endorsement for Professor Malvo's uh, article right there. Yeah. So. Well, um, I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Uh, the most important thing uh, to me is to keep the faith and to realize that the problem is there and uh, to remain determined to move in the direction of full equality. The Supreme Court and the lower courts, for the most part, have uh, Abandon the role that I knew them in uh, as a young lawyer, the, our wall against the flood, and they have become the flood itself. In uh, the courts, present Supreme Court, you know Brown versus Board in 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 all practical context today has been overturned because the Supreme Court in the Seattle and St. Louis cases says that race uh, cannot be used in an effort to bring diversity to the, to the inner city schools. The end result of which is that the schools in many of the inner cities or as segregated today as they were 60 years ago. And so we have to realize that, that we, are, we are probably in an era much akin to the time when Thurgood Marshall came to the Legal Defense Fund in, in, uh, in the 1930s. And, and we have to keep the faith and keep ever present before the courts as we come into them, the fact that we, we ain't there yet. The nation is not a colorblind nation. And keep that problem in their faces by um, uh, doing what we reasonably can be expected to do as, as good lawyers and, and um, uh, representing our clients, even though it will often seem a losing battle, but we can't, we can't give up on it because in the end, justice uh, will prevail. And so uh, uh, it's, it, it is important even though in Individual cases under Title, under title VII, uh, most likely you're going to lose because even if you survive a motion to dismiss, survive summary judgment, get to a jury and get a verdict, you still got courts like the 11th Circuit likely to overturn it. But it just, all of this just suggests to me that we've got to have a renewed determination and commitment to face this um, perplexing and recurring problem. I want to open it up for questions. Leslie's got to get the microphone. You can come up here, Leslie. You can. No, I'm just teasing. Go ahead. I think that mic should work. Is it not working? Leslie Prohl from the Legal Defense Fund. 
this is actually for both uh, judges. I mean, from what I see in Washington, I have no doubt that both of you would have difficulty getting confirmed by the Senate today. Um, but I want to ask you what I think is even more a more troubling question. I think you would both have difficulty getting nominated. There was a study done by a uh, group that does a lot of work on judges that looked at the backgrounds of all 89 Obama federal court nominees. Um, you know, lots of them haven't been confirmed, but they looked at the type of person that the Obama administration is putting on the courts. And Judge Clemming, you talked about it on your resume, you were former LDF counsel. You know, so was Thurgood Marshall, so was Constance Baker Motley, so was Robert Carter. All those people got on the bench in earlier times. This study showed that there is only one out of 89 nominees that had any public interest in their background. Only one person had ever worked for any kind of public interest organization. Now, I want to qualify that by saying that there were some legal services lawyers, had legal services experience in their background, and federal public defender service in their background. But one person had a um, job with a public interest organization, and I, I think that is just a horrific statistic, and I wondered what you thought about it. Well, I would, my first comment <clears throat> is that I won't go into any detail, but President Carter would not have appointed me a United States District Judge, but for my having been a civil rights lawyer in the Justice Department in the 1960s. And then following up on what you said, today I would not be appointed, in all likelihood, a United States District Judge because I was in the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department. And so I would agree that we are, the controversy is, is producing, I suppose, fairly bland candidates from, uh, from both parties. <laughs> well, I, I think it's, it's, it's worse than that. I think it's the, the process is, uh, is producing uh, candidates who, for the most part, are simply uh, unaware and therefore insensitive to uh, the problems of those who have not. We have to deal with the hand we're dealt. And uh, it is true that um, uh, those with a civil liberties uh, type background are less likely, <laughs> probably not likely, to be considered. And so we need to start trying to identify those who come up in the, uh, who come out of the culture uh, from which federal judges are more typically appointed and identify the ones who are more likely to be sensitive to our kinds of problems. And, and I can speak from personal experience. Um, I was succeeded by my former law clerk, Abdul Kalan. And uh, uh, Abdul was born in Sierra Leone, but came to the United States at an early age and went to Dartmouth and Penn Law School. And after he clerked for me, he went to work for the largest law firm in Alabama and uh, defending employers in Title VII cases. In fact, uh, uh, he was on the uh, the other side uh, of the uh, a big uh, uh, Fair Labor Standards Act case, the uh, uh, Family Dollar Stores case, one of the few cases where the Eleventh Circuit affirmed me, where I. Uh, <laughs> Uh, certified a collective action uh, against Family Dollar. But 
Because he was with that firm, both state senators uh, were not uncomfortable with him. And I wasn't uncomfortable with him because he and I would talk regularly when he was a partner at Bradley A. Wren. And so I had every reason to believe that if he were appointed to the bench, notwithstanding his background, uh, civil liberties causes would not be um, adversely affected. And uh, he hadn't been on the bench but a long, uh, but a short time, but already he's being criticized for acting like Judge Clement. <laughs> uh, so I, th I think we need, to, we need to try to find in that community lawyers who in their heart of hearts want to do the right thing and, and try to promote th uh, those. Any other questions here? Go ahead. Y'all, you know, you both told stories and they're powerful stories and it's an old idea about the power of experience in the law. I don't know why we even question that it's important. But Judd, I think I want to come where we do that now, where we get gather experience and talk about experiences before juries. And it was interesting, in, in your case, you said twice a jury in Gadsden got it. And I think you said it was two all white juries. Yes. Oh, and they got it, and the 11th Circuit couldn't. I, I'd be interested to hear both of you comment about, you know, it's hard to get your case before a jury now to start out with, but how, how juries have played in the civil rights process, how they played now, and just your reflections on, on the jury in this role. Well, the 64 Civil Rights Act was very carefully drafted to uh, have equitable relief and that there would not be jury trials, that judges would make the decisions. And of course, when I started practicing law in Alabama, juries were all white and all male, even in federal court. And I think now that we have more diversity, even though you might say it's an all white jury, that now we have more diversity among jurors. And, um, and, and jurors who uh, say are more urban have had more interaction with people who are different from them. That, uh, that uh, you know, that we're getting through careful jury select, selection of jurors, we can get fair-minded jurors. And, uh, and I think that uh, there was a fair-minded juror, jury, and a juror, a panel, uh, uh, a jury of fair-minded people in the Gadsden case, and I think that can be done. And, and I think a judge plays a, uh, a major role in, in seeing that they're fair-minded jurors. When I was with Judge Nixon, he spent two months with in-camera interviews with counsel on a very sensitive case to make sure that there was a fair-minded jury. So it takes actually a lot more work by the judge to do it, but it can be done. Um, I'd much rather be tried by a jury than a federal judge, <laughs> particularly the federal judges that I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and as Judge Nixon has indicated it's extremely uh, important to take the time to make sure that a fair-minded jury is selected. Uh, what with, uh, with the Batson case uh, and, and its progeny, uh, we've been able, I think, to, to come to the point where you can get uh, Title VII plaintiff can get a fair jury uh, in race cases, even when the jury is all white, as one of the juries was in the Ash case. And you know the the uh, 
The Gadsden Division of the Northern District of Alabama is very, very interesting uh, because out of it comes the Ledbetter case as well. And there, uh, there was a fair-minded jury which was overturned by the, by the court. But it is, it is uh, I think, uh, uh, much more important to get a fair jury uh, in civil rights, civil liberties type cases uh, than to have the case decided by most uh, federal judges. Ruben? been a terrific panel. You know, there's been this debate in my and Cyrus' side of the bar, which goes like this, that we should try to have judges uh, appointed who are as young as possible so they'll be there for 40 or 50 years. And the one thing that impresses me about um, this panel and the comments of Mr. Doerr and, and, and Congressman Lewis is really this was only yesterday that this happened. And, and does it bother you that as we strive to appoint these younger jurists, 40 years old, 44 years old, less than 50, that we're appointing people to the bench who really had no touch or connection with the history of what, what, what you know, led to this passage of these important pieces of legislation? And should we have an age cutoff? Well, I think that, uh, you know, the advantage is obviously to having, having say, the younger judge who's got a, a lot of energy, uh, but the, there, can be, there can be problems. Uh, the lack of uh, life experience, and that's not automatic. And you could have, let's say that you, uh, that a few years from now that there is uh, a United States District Judge uh, who is a young judge, but he served in Afghanistan, or she served in Afghanistan. You know, that's a life experience that's remarkable. And so I would not reject somebody based on age simply because of age, because, because of youth, that that person uh, can have uh, some, some very, very valuable experience. That's why I'd say that the, that the life experience is important and that there can be young people who have valuable life, younger candidates for judgeships who can have some very interesting uh, life experience as well as, uh, say, somebody 50 years old. Well, I want to make the case for uh, younger judges. I was uh, 37 when I was appointed um, and, and served for the, uh, I didn't serve the full term, but I served until I was uh, 66. Uh, the same year I was appointed, uh, instead of Fred Gray, uh, the Senate confirmed Myron Thompson, who at that time was 32 years old. And uh, his life experiences were rather limited. Uh, but he is one of the finest federal judges uh, that I know. Did everyone hear that? Uh, the, the question is, how do we let the general public know about judicial decisions that are, for the most part, kept among lawyers with cases like the Ash versus Tyson? Well, other than uh, the kind of thing that I'm doing, and that is every time someone asks me about it, uh, to, to talk about it uh, and, and to create opportunities uh, part of those in the community uh, create opportunities to get the word out about 
the kinds of decisions that are being handed down. Judge Nixon wants to address this also. I was at a uh, <clears throat> program at uh, the uh, John Kennedy Center at, uh, at Harvard, uh, <coughs> at Harvard uh, a month ago, and it was <clears throat> dealing with the role of the press and the decline in newspapers that uh, I had a great friend who was also was a, a, a friend of John Lewis, David Halberstam, who, uh, who covered the sit-ins and wrote a book about the sit-ins in Nashville, Tennessee. He started his career, he was from the East, started his career in West Point, Mississippi in the 1950s, then went to the Nashville, Tennessean, and, uh, and from there to the New York Times. They're no longer minor leagues in the area of journalism. So we're getting newspapers with less and less coverage. When I went on the bench, there was a reporter assigned to the courthouse. And there was an evening paper, there were two reporters assigned to the courthouse. Now there is not. There is just simply not the news coverage of the courts that there once was. At one time, <clears throat> what the 11th Circuit did would have made the papers. <clears throat> but with the decline <clears throat> in journalism, it's hard to get the word out. And I think that is very, very unfortunate. You know, it's more difficult to get the word out about uh, uh, just prejudice about if, if, if we do not have newspapers that are going to have reporters and are going to respond to incidents in the community that reveal racial prejudice. So it's just harder and harder to uh, educate the public. Emory Law, more than practice. And I was just wondering what Emory Law and the Emory community can do to make a difference uh, in these issues. Have conferences like yes, this. I, <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> Ruben, you want to add to that? A, I think that's making, uh, Emory Law is making a real contribution by hosting a conference like this and, and by having law students have the experience of, of listening to the people who have been here these two days. Behind, behind you, there's... Judge Clemens, my father was born and reared in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And maybe it's poetic justice, but on <clears throat> November the 18th, Georgia State University new football team, which is a predominantly minority, will be playing University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. So maybe, maybe there's some poetic justice. But may I inquire as to other federal courts, such as I'm admitted to the U.S. Court of Appeals for, for, the, for Veterans Claims and the United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, bankruptcy courts, uh, court, of, uh, the court of Federal Claims, and the immigration courts. Will you comment on diversity in those courts, which are awfully important? Well, uh, my comment will be very short because there are very few. Uh, as you know, the bankruptcy judges are chosen by the uh, courts of appeal uh, in the, or on the 11th Circuit, uh, there, there is one uh, uh, minority uh, judge and so in the 11th Circuit, I'm fairly certain that there have not been more than two uh, uh, minority bankruptcy judges um, uh, in its history. In the, in the magistrate judges are chosen by the district courts and most of the 
district courts in the 11th Circuit have uh, one, at least one um, magistrate judge, uh, except the Northern District of Alabama, we've never had one. Uh, Middle District, Montgomery has had uh, two, still has two. Um, in terms of the uh, uh, immigration judges, I, I don't know how they're appointed. I assume it's by the president. The gentleman in the back. Uh, hi, I'm uh, 2L here at Emory Law. Uh, my question is for both panelists. Um, any, any case has the possibility of having broad social implications, um, especially if it presents a novel question of law. Uh, some would argue that civil rights cases more than other cases have the possibility of having that broad social impact. So if I may play devil's advocate for a second and ask you, how would you respond to uh, an individual who says the procedural barriers created by Twombly and Iqbal may have a desperate impact on uh, civil rights cases, but that's justified because of the possibility that civil rights cases have to change society utterly, uh, completely. And so it, it, uh, it's important that only the meritorious civil rights cases are actually heard. I think that, I mean, I don't like that attitude that we have to restrict those cases. I think that, uh, as the panel members mentioned in terms of the, uh, also in terms of the class action cases, that Brown versus the board, we, the cl class action cases, those big cases change society. And I don't like the idea of having that, of that restriction on, uh, on civil rights cases through these recent decisions. And I think that uh, this has been a way that society has changed itself. America has changed itself through the judicial process as well as the legislative process. And that uh, we should, and, and the, the court's interpretation of the law and that that is a very, very important part of our history, and it should continue to be a part of our history. Once upon a time, not so very long ago, there were those who held to the view that federal courts should hear federal criminal cases and cases involving disputes between corporations. Uh, I'm afraid that after a half century of experience to the contrary, we're getting back to that point where increasingly uh, procedural barriers, uh, devices such as summary judgment, or keeping the, and devices such as limiting and restricting attorney's fees for prevailing plaintiffs, or increasingly closing the doors, uh, figuratively, the doors of justice uh, to ordinary citizens, just as the Supreme Court has actually closed its ceremonial doors. I might add, add something else to, to, our, to our comments. When uh, in my graduating class in law school, 1960, only one student applied for a clerkship in a United States District Court. It has been since that time that United States District Courts have been an exciting place to be because there was, have been so much involved in what is going on in the life of this country and that they should continue to be an exciting forum that attracts able 
applicants for judgeship and also exciting students coming out of law school to be clerks. And we should not change that culture. We have time for one more. One more question. In the nature of, of testimony, we were talking briefly a moment ago about getting fair juries. In 1994, I was asked by the state of Mississippi to help in the Beckwith case, the retrial of the murder of Medgar Evers, and, and worked in eight of those cases through the Birmingham church bombing cases, Judge Clements, that I know you and Doug Jones have talked quite a lot about. Two of those cases were federal cases in district court in Jackson, Mississippi. And our strategy had always been since Beckwith to use a supplemental juror questionnaire and to ask the judges for sequestered individual voir dire if we could get it, believing that we could more certainly get a, a fair jury that way. And in each case, in all eight of those cases, <clears throat> the judges, both state and federal judges, including Judge Barber, who is Haley Barber's cousin, of course, in Jackson, granted us that ability. So through the work of the judges, I think we did get fair juries in those cases. And I think that's testimony to those judges. Well, yes. in, the, in the case that, uh, that Cyrus Mary was talking about that, uh, that I tried when he was a clerk, we had questionnaires and individual voir dire. And I had a case that started in, <clears throat> in 07 involving a drug conspiracy stretching from Los Angeles to uh, Charleston, South Carolina allegations of uh, the main defendant of uh, six planned intentional premeditated murders. Uh, he was having members of his own organization kill when they, uh, when they knew too much that, and the government asking for the death penalty. Had questionnaires, individual voir dire, and the jury selection <clears throat> began in February, and we did not, and opening statements were in May, we went through 1,200 jurors in order to get a panel of fair-minded jurors. So it can be, I mean, it's up to a judge to uh, <clears throat> supervise that uh, jury selection in difficult cases so that there can be fair-minded jurors. And I might mention, just as <clears throat> an aside, there was a young black woman who served on that jury, was a African black defendant. And during that process of serving on that jury, she made the decision to go to law school. <laughs> Any other final words, Judge Clement, Judge Nixon? I have nothing else. Well, there's something that I, <clears throat> I would like to say, that it was important to me to serve in the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, and of course, uh, I served under Burke Marshall for a short period of time and, and under uh, John Doerr. <clears throat> And it was important to me as a white Southerner <clears throat> to be involved in that process, that the process of eliminating discrimination in the South should not be left to the leadership of African Americans and Northern whites, but Southern whites should be involved in it also. And I will say we are aware of the accomplishments of the civil rights movement and towards blacks no longer being second class citizens but becoming first class citizens. But also <clears throat> what is often forgotten is that the civil rights movement lifted from the shoulders of the white South, the terrible burden of having to defend that which is morally indefensible. 
In 10 years, in 1975, I went back to Selma. I talked to Wilson Baker, who had been the police commissioner that John Doyle mentioned, was the one who ended up defeating Jim Clark, a decent man. And I asked him, said, would the white people of Dallas County like to go back to what it was like? before the 1960s, and he told me, he said, no, they would not want to go back. So it was not just liberty, freedom for blacks, it was freedom from that terrible burden of having to defend that which is morally indefensible. Those words, thank you very much.